Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're, we're talking to a man with the most incredible boots in the barbecue scene. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. In this episode, we're talking to Vic Lavenger, the cooking comedian and the founder of the Chimney Cartel. And if you're not familiar with the Chimney Cartel, it's a really fascinating story and I'm looking forward to getting into that in just a moment. But before we get there, I've got a couple of announcements I need to run by you first. The first one is I'd like to thank Jagged Woodfind for coming on board as our podcast partner for this episode. Based out of WA and shipping around the, 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 the country and soon to be the world, uh, if you're in the market for a new smoker oven, uh, cabinet smoker, asado grill, custom kitchen build, whatever you want to do, Glenn and Jules can get it worked out for you and get it sorted. Great people, they do a wonderful job, so do check them out. Now, if you're at the beginning of your barbecue journey, head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com, grab yourself a copy of our ebook, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. That was recently awarded by the NBBQA over in the United States, so you know it's a good quality read. It's everything you need to know to go from zero to hero in the world of low and slow barbecue. Completely free. Head on over there. Check it out. Smokinghotconfessions.com. And a big good evening and welcome to the people that are joining us online in the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community tonight. This is our Facebook group that we run for barbecue fans such as yourselves. And if you're not there yet, make sure you head on over there and join us. We do the live podcast recordings and we just hang out and talk about barbecue. It's a family friendly space, which let's face it, that's pretty rare on Facebook these days. So make sure you come join us there as well. Now, if you're catching this episode later on on the replay, if it's on YouTube, make sure you give us a thumbs up, a subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Over on Facebook, it's all about the likes, the comments, and the shares. Now, on Instagram, we love the little love hearts and the comments and the follows. And if you're listening in on a podcast app, do make sure you give us a five-star rating and review. That really helps push us up the charts and spread our message of barbecue love out into the wider world. Now, I reckon that's probably about all the blah, blah, blah you need from me. Let's get Vic in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Vic, long time no see, my friend. It's good to have you in the confessional. It's, man, I'm glad to be here. I've got a few things to confess today. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I have no doubt about that at all. Now, before we get started, i got to know, are you wearing the boots right now? I, and you're lucky this early and it's, it's like 645 where I am right now. So you're lucky that I have a shirt on. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Now for, for people who are not familiar with, with your boots, give us an idea of the, uh, of the boots that were, uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, probably the ones, the, the Cobras, the, uh, the red with the, uh, the white Cobra head on them. Now I don't, I don't have those on, but they, I, those are probably the most talked about boots in the barbecue world. I reckon they are. They they stopped me in my tracks. Literally, I I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen anything like it before. You got that big cobra head sticking up out of the out of the toe section of each boot. Oh yeah, it, it's a pretty sharp booty. I had them. Um, I bought them. They were solid white, and uh, so I had them like, well, that's just not uh, not. I don't like that. So I went and had them dyed red, except for the cobra. So the cobra stood out even more. So it's uh, they're pretty cool boots. Sounds like they might have been originally designed for Elvis Presley if they were all white. They they might have been. They might have been. Please tell me you got the rhinestone suit tucked away in the cupboard there somewhere. Oh, I do. It's over here in the cupboard. It's uh, I got the big buckle. And instead of EP, it says VC on it. So excellent, excellent. I love it. So, mate, tell me what was the last thing that you barbecued? Oh wow, the uh, we did. I just come back from the American Royal. And so we did everything. We did um, some brisket. We did a whole hog. Uh, we were a part of the, um, the, they don't do hog at the American Royal, but where we do for a, a fundraiser for Operation Barbecue Relief uh, here in America, uh, we do a big fundraiser. And one of that is a group of us, Mark Lambert uh, from Sweet Swan of Mine, uh, B&O, The Shed, a few of us get together and cook pigs. Um, so we had a whole hog that we cooked. So I did that. It was a lot of fun. It's been a long time since I've cooked a hog. So I helped, I helped a little bit back in Memphis in May, but this is one that we actually cooked. 
Uh, so it was a lot of fun to get back in that whole hog cooking. And of course we did the big, the big four, um, brisket, ribs, pork, and, uh, chicken. And at the American Royal, because they're, they're involved with the national Turkey Federation. Uh, we actually smoked, uh, Turkey as well. So at the American Royal, you actually do five meats instead of just four. Yeah, right. That's interesting. Yeah. So were you competing uh, like under the OBR banner there or were you un- like under a different team name? So I was on a different team. The uh, David Malek uh, of Gunter Wilhelm Cutlery, he sponsored a team. And uh, so I was uh, the head cook there, one of the head cooks there. And so we um, put together this little team and had a uh, had just a grand time. And he uh, he sold his knives down front. We handled his cooking team up at the top, and uh, did pretty good. Yeah, how'd you go? Ah, uh, well, I mean, we didn't win, so we didn't do that good. Uh, <laughs> but we weren't laughing. That's that's you know when you get to cooking at five hundred teams, and you know you're not the last one on the list. That's that's pretty good. So we were about middle ways. So it's not uh, not too awful bad. That's solid at a big competition like the Royal. I said that's solid at a big competition like the Royal. It is. It is. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. The um, I, I tell people, I said, my main goal is not to be last. If I'm higher than last, then I've succeeded. And we, I mean, you know, we we finish higher than some some big teams, uh, lower than others. So you know, it, it was he's it quite proud of our our finish. Uh, next year, we'll go for a win. Yeah, very good, very good. Now, with all the craziness that that's going on in in the world at the moment, how was the royal different this year to previous years? Um, you know, I I think that the amount of teams were about the same, um, but the public, if you've ever been to the American Royal, uh, the public was down a little bit. So I'm not sure how much they were allowing the public in, or if they were monitoring that. So to me, it seemed like the public didn't didn't come in as much. Uh, same thing happened in Memphis in May back in, uh, um, well, back in May, uh, the teams, the teams were down, um, at Memphis in May. And then the public was down the American Royal, uh, we call it the American Royal, but there's teams from all over the world. They have, uh, usually 20 international teams show up and this year they had like eight. So, uh, so it was, it was down in that regards, but there was other, other teams. It's about 500 teams is what shows up the American Royal. Yeah, eight is still more teams than I would have predicted. Yeah, it, it was quite um, – uh, I, was, I was wondering what they were going to have um, because of, cause of the Memphis in May was down so much. Um, I, was, I was kind of afraid. And there was people talking that the Royal you – know, they were worried about the Royal, the, the Royal may cancel – and I'm like, look, we're like two weeks out. It's not going to cancel. So different, different parts of our country were having different regulations. And so um, they were worried about traveling from where they were all the way over to Kansas City, uh, which is in the middle of the United States. And so they didn't know whether the Royal might cancel last minute. And they're like, yeah, not, not this last minute. They're going to they're gonna go ahead. And they did. It was, it was great. It was successful. And and uh, everybody had a good time, which is the main reason you go to a barbecue contest. Oh, yeah, and to win some money. But, you know, since I didn't win any money, I had to settle for a good time. Mate, I'll, I'd, I'd take a good time over a, over a check any day, I think. I would too. Although I guess it depends how big the check is. Everyone's got a price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can be bought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just putting it out there. Make the check big enough. I'm yours. <laughs> 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 so tell me, mate, how did you get into barbecue? Um, wow. Um, you know, me and my brother, uh, he started like my brother's, you know, he went to culinary school and things. Um, but then he got a smoker and started smoking meat and I kind of got interested in it. And then he bought a new smoker, gave me his old one. And so I started playing around and, uh, and this has been maybe 20 years and just gradually got got going, and um, uh, I started just posting on on social media like, "Hey, check out these ribs, check out this chicken, check out whatever." And a buddy of mine says, "Won't you enter a contest?" And I'm like, "All right." So I paid an entry fee, entered a non-sanctioned contest um, that was sponsored by Honey Nut Cheerios, 
and they put a bounty on if anybody yeah it's crazy they they were at a barbecue contest and uh it was it was a cool contest because out in the field they had this great big cereal box that was going to be a giant honeycomb and this i mean this was like three or four stories high cereal box looking thing that was going to be a giant honeycomb for bees and they were going to drain all the honey out of it and use it in a special um special marketing for uh honey nut cheerios or whatever so they sponsored it and then put a bounty on the chicken category if anybody can cook chicken using honey nut cheerios and i'm like well why not um so i crushed up a bunch of honey nut cheerios used that for breading over um some chicken legs threw it all in a smoker smoked the entire thing and i won so i'm like cool beans uh so they uh so they liked it and that hooked me i'm like man i gotta do this again and so now i, I entered everything i entered a world food championship all the barbecue championship all the barbecue contests and state contests and and who can eat the longest or farthest or the most content, whatever. If it had food in it, I was trying to enter it. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of fun, man. And it, I don't know how many, I imagine a lot of your listeners are all into to cooking and maybe some food sports stuff. Man, if you're not competing, uh, give it a whirl. Um, try the, the backyard or the be, uh, I'm not sure what they call it uh, in Australia, but uh, we call it the backyard teams here um try that it's a little cheaper to enter get your foot wet and uh and give it give it a whirl man it's a it's a lot even if you don't win like we were just talking about even if we don't win um the camaraderie uh the fun that you have at one of these events is just you can't put a price tag on it and it's just a lot of fun then a family you meet uh beyond just your cul-de-sac or your neighborhood uh the family you meet in the barbecue world is second to none yeah, well said. I mean, at at the very worst, you're going to get to hang out for the weekend with your mates and have a couple of drinks yeah. and cook some food and and listen to some good music. So, yeah, and you can eat barbecue time. because we only put in a little bit in these boxes. The rest of it you get to eat. So, I mean, how how can you go wrong with that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, I'd I'd imagine that you have uh your your access would be quite wide open to uh, to different brands of barbecues and whatnot. What is sitting on your back porch at the moment? What do you cook on at home? Uh, well, you know, I like to do crazy things. I mean, I've got the Green Mountain Grills. Um, I, ha- I had a, um, a big green egg. Uh, my favorite cooker is the my very first one. Um, it's a... It's a um, uh, I can't even remember the name of it, but I got it at Walmart. Um, or my brother got it and gave it to me. But it's it's the one I learned on. It's it's not it's not heavily insulated. It's not um, well. It's just a cheap cooker, just to be quite honest. Offset cooker. My my favorite uh, as far as smoking is offset cookers. I love the offset cookers. Um, you know, a lot of guys are getting into the pellets and the, the barrels and I've got, you know, I've got some barrels. Uh, if you want to do some, the ugly drum is a good one. Gateway drums are good ones. Um, but the, but the offset to me is, is true smoking. Uh, you, you know, you put the fire off to the side, you get the, the smoke going through and the heat going through, uh, getting that nice low and slow. You can't hot and fast an offset cooker. You know, it's all low and slow, and that's the best way to do barbecue. A lot of, a lot of guys are following the Myron Mixon hot and fast model, and you know you can't argue with Myron Mixon. He's, you know, he won Memphis in May, so and he's Myron Mixon for goodness sakes. Um, a lot of guys are following that, but to me, I think it's a trend. I think if you truly enjoy smoking, uh, low and slow is the way to go, man. So my favorite grill, and I think the reason why it's my favorite is. Um, uh, it was my first one, uh, but it taught me fire management because it's not insulated. It's not, you know, it's not double steel and it's not got the insulation around it and it's not this and it's not all that. Um, it taught me how to manage my hot spots and how to manage my my fire um, in the in the uh, the firebox. So it's um, it's. I, I think that's the reason why I'm fond of it. But I, I've, I've cooked on everything. I've cooked on old hickories, um, um, southern prides, 
you name it. But it's it's that's my favorite one. Mate, that's really interesting that it's uh, such a cheap cooker from a from a big box store, and you've still got it twenty years later. Yeah, I've had to replace the firebox once, and the <laughs> legs are starting to rust on it, so I have to replace the legs. But the barrel itself is um, rock solid, man. It's just it's been out in the weather. I've left it out there uncovered. I've left it covered. Um, I did one time where I didn't smoke on it for a while because I was trying other smokers. Um, I did have to um, run some critters out of it once. And uh, so I was like, all right, so it's, I, so I've neglect, I, I apologize to it. I'm like, darling, I'm sorry. I've neglected you. I'll cook in you uh, more often now. So it's, uh, so, you know, you got, you got to take care of your cookers. You know, you got to talk to them. The women like to talk to flyers. We got to talk to our cookers and let them know that we still appreciate them. Definitely. No doubt about that at all. Now you, you're mentioning family there and we've, and we've had a bit of a chat um, about your brother and, and, and how he got you into, uh, into barbecue. Now you are um, originally from Kentucky, I believe. So can you tell us a bit about the, the, the Kentucky style of barbecue? Oh yeah. Well, um, mutton is big in, in Kentucky. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So, um, usually not necessarily where I grew up cause I grew up in the mountains in the Eastern part of Kentucky, but in the central Western part of Kentucky, mutton is, is like cooking brisket, uh, in Texas. It's, it's crazy. Um, uh, but Kentucky is that weird, um, that weird area that draws from a lot of places. Like it draws from the Carolinas, uh, but I guess the predominant way is the Memphis style um, of barbecue. So they, they, they'll do a lot of that. Um, but it's being, being there, uh, you're not afraid to try something new. So a lot of guys are doing, doing different things, um, doing different things in Kentucky. But it's, I've been out of there so long. I try to keep in touch with some of them, but I've been out of Kentucky for probably 25 years now, but I still try to keep in, in contact with them. But that's where I, you know, that's where I learned to smoke. I mean, dad never did anything. Uh, his, his biggest uh, claim to fame is he would buy a $9 tabletop grill from, from some store, cook burgers and hot dogs on it and said he was barbecuing. So, and it's, uh, that, you know, it's, that's, that's my history of barbecue back in Kentucky. Fair enough. It sounds like what we grew up with here in the eighties and nineties in Australia was all just uh, sausages and steaks on the on yeah. the grill and burnt black on the outside, raw in the middle. And if it wasn't uh, black enough, it went back on the grill again. Exactly right. <laughs> and it still stayed raw in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I, I was reading up on your on your bio, and you do some really interesting things. You're a freelance writer, professional speaker, and uh, an award winning um, cook. So it, is all of that food related? Like, have you built this entire life around food? I have. Um, well, the, the speaking part started years ago, and I was more of a motivational, um, you know, let's follow our dreams type speaker. And then as I got more into cooking, it has all kind of evolved into everything's, everything's food now. Um, the, the writing now that I do is all food related uh, in some aspects. Um, I still try to dabble into the motivational writings as well. Like follow your dreams, but I try, always tied into, uh, back into food, uh, cooking, especially because there's so much, there's so many lessons to learn when you cook. Um, you know, if you're cooking desserts, you want to follow the recipes and it, just to get that perfect. If you're, if you're cooking steaks or you're cooking barbecue, you know, it's all about trial and error to get, you know, don't, don't fall down and figure you're, you're a bad cook just because you, you, you made one bad brisket, you know, uh, it's always about trying and, and, and growing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's all about food now. So I, I write for uh, tailgater magazine. I write for, um, national barbecue news and, um, it's, it's, um, I enjoy it. I've always written in some aspects, so, but now I've, I've, I get to write about my true passion of, of cooking and, and trying to, trying to grow people and, and cook some good food. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to imagine you as a, as like a Tony Robbins with a grill. Oh yeah. So I, I go out there in my little Smokey Joe and, and just throw out some burgers and just toss them out. You get a burger, you get a burger, you get a burger. <laughs> awesome. 
Just as long as you make sure you grab the burger and you don't actually grab the coal from underneath and start flicking the coal out of people. The coals are the ones that go to the hecklers. So the guys out there yelling at you, <laughs> yeah. in my hair, you can have a burger. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a B&B charcoal burning hot fire thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Now, h- how did that lead into the cooking comedian stuff? Well, I also did stand-up for several years. Uh, stand-up comedy like, you know, Larry the Cable Guy and Jeff Foxworthy and those guys. And so I started moving into – the more I got into competition cooking and, and just cooking in general, uh, the more of that went into my comedy routine. So I'm like, all right, let me try to brand myself as the cooking comedian. And then, um, and then as that was starting to you know, pick up a little bit, um, things happened in the world and then all the shows and everything stopped everywhere. So, um, so as that kind of started fading out, I thought, let me just go in and, and go back to my roots and, and speak and MC and teach and write and just cook. And so, so I, so when I do demos um, and I'm talking like on these things, I try to be funny uh, to keep people interested in. I think, I think people learn more if they're laughing. Uh, so if you're coming to watch me um, cook a steak or whatever, um, and you're sitting in one of my classes, then if you're laughing, you're paying attention and you're listening and you're, um, uh, you're, you're a part of the event. You're not just, um, you're not just there just because there was no other class to go to. Um, and I, you know, I talk about communicating. I think sometimes, uh, and you're in, you're in communication business around a podcast and everything. I think sometimes some of our, our best cooks can be the worst communicators. And so I try to teach communication as well. Cause that's where my, that's where my degrees are in is in communication. So I try to help them, uh, learn. So I, I started trying to be, um, trying to be all things to all people in a way, but then I started narrowing it down. So let's talk about communication. Let's make you a better presenter. Let's do some great presentations that are funny myself. And that's where the cook and comedian started. And it's kind of, uh, taking a hiatus with everything going on right now. So I don't do as much stand up anymore as I used to. And it's all, it's all food, man. Food makes the world go around for me right now. It certainly does, man. It certainly does. And that's interesting what you were saying about the need to teach communication. I, um, at, at one stage, a couple of years ago, I was lecturing at a university, but I don't hold a PhD. And uh, some people were kind of like looking down on me and that. So I went and I sat in on their classes and I very quickly worked out that just having a PhD doesn't make you a great teacher. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I, had, I sat under a lot of PhDs and I'm like, really? That's how you all talk? And uh, so it's, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to sit down and listen to somebody with a great education and you know, they're smart. They just can't get it out. And I found that with some of our cooks, I mean, they, they, they hold so much knowledge in teaching, but if you put them in front of a, a group, they can't get their knowledge out. And so uh, I want to, I want to help those guys and anybody else that wants to get into it. Some of the best presenters uh, that I've seen has been Eric Hodson of Boar's Not Out. And, uh, and I think they were just in Australia right before everything uh, uh, went wacky. Uh, and Mark Lambert of Sweet Swine of Mine. Those are two of the best presenters that still have knowledge and still have presentations. Some of the others that I've sat with have great knowledge and I'm able to glean it out. But sometimes it was like pulling teeth at the dentist. I was like, all right. So, so there's, there's a need for it. So whenever, um, whenever I have an opportunity to teach a class on communication, I always jump at it, especially in the cookie world. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing some very important work there, particularly with everybody trying to move online at the moment and uh, teach online yeah. cooking classes and whatnot. Now I'm I'm going to uh, unashamedly pick some low flying uh, low hanging fruit here. You mentioned Jocks, uh, Jeff Foxworthy before. I'm hoping oh, yeah. I'm hoping that you had a bit. You might be a pit master if blah 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 blah. <laughs> uh, I wish I wish I, I I tried to come up with some of that stuff, and it got to be a little too um, too adult in some aspects. I'm like all right, so because my my routines was more. Just like your shows, it was more family friendly. It wasn't like you know, 
uh, grandma may blush a little bit in my my show, but it was it was more family friendly. So I started talking about um, some things that we talk about at barbecue events that not just uh, that may not go well in my style of comedy. So I was trying to work on some of that, but I may come back to that because I've I've grown a little bit in my in my pitmaster area. So we may come back to that in some writings and um, uh, maybe some classes and stuff. I may throw those in there just uh, for some zingers. If you're looking for your next barbecue smoker or grill, Jagged Woodfire has got what you need. Owners Julianne and Glenn are multiple award-winning barbecue competitors who have even travelled to the US to compete at the World Barbecue Championships in Houston, Texas. Based out of Perth and shipping nationwide, Jagged is one of the largest pit builders in the country and has an ever-growing lineup of meat cooking machinery. Not only do they have their now famous smoker ovens, their incredibly efficient gravity-fed cabinets are proving extremely popular in commercial settings, and they also make some of the most stylish asado grills you're ever going to see. Jagged is also well known for amazingly detailed custom work ranging from backyard designs all the way to installations in commercial kitchens. Proudly Australian designed, owned and manufactured, you can find out more at jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D. Once again, head to jaggedwoodfired.com.au spelled J-A-G-R-D to learn more. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, Vic. So we actually first met in person in 2019 uh, at the uh, the NBBQA conference in Kansas City. And as we were just discussing before, that was right before things kind of went crazy and you had to sort of start scaling down Cooking Comedian and you've reinvented yourself as the, as the Chimney Cartel. So tell us all about Chimney Cartel. Um, chimney Cartel is, um, <laughs> well, I was, July 4th is a big event, a uh, big holiday here in America. And, uh, and I had to MC any, um, a 4th of July big event, uh, fireworks, um, they were raffling, they had bands playing, all kinds of stuff, but they also had a state contest and I wanted to cook this state contest, but I also had my responsibilities cause they were hiring me to be there. And, and I didn't want to take my grill. I didn't want to do a big setup cause I had to go back and forth. So I just took, um, a chimney, uh, it's a Weber chimney and a grill grate <clears throat> and some charcoal and put it on a brick, fired it up. And, um, the, uh, there's people come around and says, now, if you win this thing, or if you finish better than I am, I'm giving up cooking. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so the first time I did it, I didn't practice. I just took it. I'm like, I'll just cook it. And I ended up finishing 13th out of about 40 cooks. And I'm like, all right. So that's kind of fun. And then a friend of mine they were cooking an ancillary. So they fired up their chimney, put their cast iron skillet on the chimney. And they said, in the spirit of Vic Clevenger, we're cooking on a chimney. I said, man, that's awesome. I hashtagged it chimney cartel. And, uh, and I'm like, light, you know, all those cartoon light bulbs went off above my head. And, um, and I was like, all right, so this may be on to something. So I played around with it and, you know, made t-shirts like the one I'm wearing. And, and, um, and then I thought, all right. So we decided to start making grills and do some other things. I'm like, well, I got to turn this into a business. So that's how it all started, man. Just because I was too lazy to drag out a grill to go to a contest. And now it's, <laughs> now it's, a, it's a corporation. Uh, we're doing grills. I'm riding. I'm traveling the country now. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's made me more well-known to being a comedian. I can tell you that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it, I, I was looking at some of the photos and it's, it's a very uh, interesting design compared to how it started. It's just a chimney with a grill grate across the mm-hmm. top. Um, obviously this is a, uh, an, an audio based, uh, presentation. So, uh, can you, uh, paint a picture with words as to how this thing looks and how it works? Yeah. So think of your, you think of your normal chimney that you would use to start your fire. Um, but think of that chimney being square and three feet tall. 
and that's pretty much but the fire is still at the same level that you would have in your coals when you start your chim when you start your chimney fire so it's still so basically um two feet of that is just um just a stand to hold the firebox and uh you just put it on there put your grill grates on there uh you can get uh, custom ones at grill grates uh with um with brad barrett and them so you you, you can do that but it's basically a square, three foot chimney that's 11 inches by 11 inches so it's 11 inches square and you just you just cook on it it's it's amazing uh and we've got other things you put on you put it we have a grate that goes on it you can get custom grill grates from grill grate uh, we got a jalapeno popper uh, plate to put on it, um, a little mini pot to put a, uh, a one-quart cast iron um, uh, Dutch oven porky pot uh, kind of thing. So, uh, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of things. We got a shelf you can put there. So it, it's pretty versatile. I've actually smoked ribs in it. I uh, put my fire all the way down to the bottom um and hung ribs and smoked those so it's it's quite versatile i still haven't figured out how to do a brisket on it but you know i've got time when you've got uh 11 inches square cooking area that's going to be a it's going to be a small slice of brisket yeah, it'll fit in the box <laughs> yeah. yeah so obviously then the the firebox is uh, uh movable it is so the um we have stairs to see we got got handles on it. we stair step down so you can put it down lower or you can put it up higher i like to keep it like kind of right in the middle when i'm doing steaks uh because it doesn't if, if i do get any flare-ups it's not too tall where i get spots on my steak um it, it's the um it's adjustable so yeah so you can have it however you want to if you want to do a slower cook um then you put it down if you want to do a faster cook you can put it higher uh, we've even got a, an insurging put in it just for an ambiance, um, staying on your back deck. So, you know, you put some wood down in there, the flames will grow and you have like a little, uh, roast. I, I was at the shed with it and some little boys came over with some marshmallows and, uh, roasted marshmallows. So you can even make s'mores. I mean, who doesn't have, who has a grill that you can make s'mores with? So, you know, everybody else is like, oh, we got to have a campfire. No, not when you have a chimney cartel cooker, you can make them right there on the cooker. So get you a stick and some marshmallows and you're good to go. Yeah, sounds good, man. Now it's uh it it's obviously it's a it's was principally designed as a as a steak cooker, but you mentioned all of the uh all, all of the other the other accessories and stuff. Tell mm -hmm. me some of the more some of the more sort of um uh outside of the box things that, that you've been able to cook on it. Uh well, like I said, I was, I was able to smoke ribs on it, so um, I just hung the ribs, put my, instead of having the handles in and I just laid the handles on top, hung the ribs down and treated it almost like a, like a barrel cooker and, uh, and cooked it that way. Uh, you got to watch cause I've got a lot of the way it's designed. There's a lot of airflow. So there again, your, your fire management, the purpose is it's true grilling. Like I know a lot of guys, they have, um, they had the PKs and, and the Weber's and they put the lid down and they make their grills almost a confection oven in a way. So they get that heat circulating and all this stuff. This year has no lid. I mean, we're designing a lid because people have asked for it. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll make money on it. I'll sell you a lid to put on it. <laughs> um, but, it's, but it's primarily designed to be an actual grill uh, where you're, you're open fire. Um, there's no lid. You got to manage your, your meat. Uh, you got to manage your fire with it. Um, so it's, it's just kind of like taking, um, Taking a grate, putting it on some rocks, putting a fire underneath it, throwing, uh, throwing your fish or your venison or your steaks or whatever you got with you when you're camping, just cooking on on the fire. So I wanted people to truly grill, uh, and that's and that's what it is. And it's designed. If a lot of competitors they want the they want the the lid and stuff, and that's fine. Um, but I'm going more for a backyarder, you know, that really wants to wants to grill and fire manage and. And so far, you know, everybody sees it. They think it rocks. So it's um, it's pretty good. Just the uh, some people are just afraid it because it doesn't have a lid. They can't get the heat circulating in it. So I don't know what you're gonna do. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, how many uh, how many SCA cookoffs have you uh, taken it to? I've taken it to several. I'm not won one yet. The best I came in 
Yes. With it was um, seventh. Um, so I'm still I'm still you know learning how to uh, get everything together myself. Um, although I, I love it and I've I've not won with it yet because you're you're, you're going against world champions with some of these things. So it, it wasn't the cooker, uh, the the physical cooker. It may have been this cooker. Uh, that made a mistake. Um, and you know, work, working on my flavor profiles. So, uh, the, the, the cooker itself did great. Um, the flavor profile has been a little off lately. So that's what I'm working on right now. So I, I, I know where my mistakes are and it's not the grill. It's the, uh, it's the, the chef or the pit master or whatever. Yeah. What is it? The, what is the expression in IT? The, the, the problem is between the seat and the keyboard? <laughs> it's pretty much. That's it. That's my rules. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned that the, that the chimney cartel has, uh, has boosted your profile more than being a comedian ever has, and I understand that you're currently in the middle of a cooking adventure tour. I am. So I'm traveling the United States, uh, going to events, going to outdoor shows, um, you know, rocking my, my cookers, um, take them to events and pe- people see me cooking on them. Um, then they're like, Oh man, you know, then where can I get one of those? So I to my website to order. Um, uh, and I'm taking them to outdoor shows. These cookers are great for camping, fishing. Um, they don't take up much room. I mean, they're only 11 inches square. So how much room can they take up really? And, um, so they, they're great when people go out tailgating, uh, I don't know how if y'all tailgate much in Australia, um, but we um, we tailgate a lot at football games here, and uh, and they're great for that. Uh, you can cook you some steaks on it, some burgers. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm going to with the hunting and fishing and the tailgating shows, uh, getting my grills where they need to be, uh, and you know, and push them other sponsors as well. You know, the uh, the rubs that sponsor me, like, like Boar's Night Out, uh, the knives, Gunter Wilhelm. Um, so it, it's, you go there and, sh- and open up a whole different market. Um, I, I tell people, part of what I, what I talk to people about is, is I think sometimes when you're in our position, um, we talk amongst ourselves. Um, like me and you will talk. Uh, but when somebody comes from the outside into us, uh, we kind of like, I don't know how to talk to them about what it is. So what I want to do is, is take my brand um, and the brand of my sponsors to beyond just the barbecue world uh, and open up. Cause I think if I take it farther out to the, to the hunting and fishing guys, that'll bring them over to seeing what we're doing in the barbecue industry. And, you know, quite frankly, when you're in the money making business, um, then um, you there's only so much. I told somebody the other day, it's like it's like selling uh, Amway um, or Tupperware. There's only so many parties that mom could have with her friends to where they had all the Tupperware. Now, who does she sell to? So um, so let's get out of our little box to expand what we have because what we have as barbecuers and grillers is great. Um, our rubs in our, in our family is better than what they'll buy at the store. Um, our sauces are better than what they buy at the store. Our techniques are better than what they're going to learn from a manager at a store who's just paid to do it. Um, so why not take what we have outside of our family to show other people? And then make make our family larger and more. Even if it's just going to the guy in the backyard, uh, how many? Especially now during this um, crazy time, more and more people have been cooking out outside at home because they couldn't go to the restaurants. So um, this is our time to shine in in our lifestyle. Our grill masters, our pit masters. Uh, our the low and slower is the hot and fasters. This is our time to get our brands to the guys cooking in the backyard for their neighborhood and their family. Yeah, well said. I've actually noticed that there's been a that there's been a lot of people that are, uh, you know, they're 
they're quite well known in the barbecue scene and they're crossing over more into the outdoors area. You've got guys like, uh, you know, uh, Craig Vahaga, the barbecue ninja. He's, um, yep. he's quite often posting about his alligator hunting and his, uh, his duck hunting and stuff like that. And our, our, our very own Jess Pryles, who's living in Texas now, she's working with uh, outdoor knife companies and gun companies and different things like that mm-hmm. and sort of di- diversifying the, uh, the, the product field there, which um, is obviously it's a, it's a very wise, very smart thing to do because, as you said before, if you're not in the business of making money, why are you in business? Right, exactly. And I, and I think a lot of our champions um, – and I, I'm not a, I'm not a world champion. I have, I've done okay. Um, the, a lot of our champions don't market themselves where they could, they could get larger sponsorship, I think, um, to, to further their, their quest of being champions, to further their quest of explaining what they do. Um, so why not, um, go to sponsors, outside of us like hey man i really need a rub, i need a rub sponsor well having a rub sponsor is not putting gas in my van so why not go to a um a fuel company and say look i'll promote your your station if you provide me a gas card or a hotel chain or sunglasses so i started thinking about everything that i use to cook barbecue that's not barbecue and I'm like, those are the people that I need to approach. And because our, our business is multi-million dollar business that a lot of people don't even know about in the corporate world. And that's, that's where I want to take our brands. And that's where I want to take my brand and, uh, and, and get the sponsorship from them and make money and, and promote people. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, Vic, this is the third segment of the show. This is the part of the show where our our guests get to share some wisdom and impart some knowledge for the viewers and the listeners. And as a motivational, uh, as I said before, Tony Robbins with a grill, um, you're quite interested in, in helping people develop. And so you were saying that you wanted to talk about how to grow as a cook. So I'm going to sit back and look pretty, as you said, and just sort of throw it over to you. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think there's a lot of things that, that we, um, and you do look pretty, by the way. I just want to say that. Thank you. I've been waiting all night for you to give me that compliment. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I just wait away for the right time. The, see how, see how the motivational works. Now you got a smile on your face. The rest of your day is going to end just perfect. But it, it's, it's a, um, we gotta, we gotta grow as cooks. I think we get, we get stale. Uh, I remember growing up um, until my mom really started exploring her culinary stuff. It was meat and potatoes. Like we had chicken livers, macaroni and cheese. We had hamburgers and hot dogs, steak and potatoes. Sunday, we always had a roast beef with roasted potatoes in it. Um, Thursdays, we'd have cube steak and gravy. But it was the same thing over and over to where your point is like, Mom, do you know how to cook anything else? And of course she started growing and wanting to learn more how to cook. And, and I got to thinking about us as cooks. Why aren't you, if you're in a food sport, why aren't you finishing higher in your barbecue contest or your steak contest than you are? Is it your grill? Nah, you're, I mean, you're cooking with a, a name brand grill. Is it the charcoal? No, nah, you've got great charcoal. Is it the wood you're using? No, you're got, so it has to be you. If you're not finishing, what about you is keeping you from finishing a higher than you do? So you need to learn your fire management. Maybe your, maybe your grill's too, too cold or too hot. So let's, let's work on our fire management. Maybe your flavor profiles, uh, you may like it at home, uh, but maybe it's just not quite there where you need it for a contest. Uh, maybe you're not trying to not practice that enough at home. So there's, there's ways to learn and to grow as a cook. I was at a contest, like we was talking in the, like the pre-show, we was having a conversation. I was at the, um, at the shed barbecue contest, um, in, uh, uh Ocean Springs, Mississippi. And they, they, they have a hundred and some people cook that contest, you know, but they were doing two steaks, a steak A and a steak B, uh, for the SCA. 
uh, State Cook-Off Association, if you're, some of your listeners may not be familiar with it. Um, so steak A was going to be a ribeye steak, just like the rules say, uh, ribeye steak, uh, minimum of choice, but it was going to be Wagyu because they had Hassel in there, uh, Hassel Cattle Company. Uh, and then for steak B, they got permission to do steak B as a New York strip. And uh, people were losing their minds over having to cook a New York strip. The rules say it has to be a ribeye. I practice on cooking a ribeye. I d- you either could cook a steak or you can't. Uh, I know a ribeye is is a different cut of meat, and you may have to. It's not as fatty. You have to treat it a little different. Um, but you got to learn to cook it. Um, like my my claim to fame as far as world championships is not cooking meat. Uh, I mine's desserts for goodness sakes. Um, I go into a kitchen at the World Food Championship, cook a dessert, walk away in third. So, um, so you, you've got to, you've got to grow as a cook. If you're not trying to do something different, trying to grow. And that's one of the reasons why the chimney cartel is so much fun is everybody is using their, their Weber kettles, their PKs, their M grills, their hasty bakes, all these ovens. And I walk in with a chimney and, and just cook. And not because I can't cook on a PK. I've got a PK. I've got, I've, I've, I've cooked on um, M grills and hasty bakes. I've done it all. But to me, it's, it's learning more and more on different ways to cook and different things to cook. Um, I'm dating a girl now for who, who's from South Africa. Um, and she's opened my, my culinary palate to so many different flavors. Like here in America, it's meat and potatoes. That's that's our thing, but there's so many other flavors throughout the world um, that it's it's. Um, she's just helped me to grow in that. That I want to try things I wouldn't normally try. I want to cook things I wouldn't normally cook, just to grow because I want to be, I want to be a great cook. I don't want to just be cook a great steak. I want to be an all around uh, an all around cook. And with the SCA putting a bigger emphasis on the ancillaries, um, then that helps me to expand that culinary creativity. Because once you cook a steak, if once you got your steak down, uh, man, a steak is a steak is a steak. Um, I'll cook it the exact same way. I'll cook it the, I'll use the same flavor profile. I'll cook my exact same steak. But in your ancillaries, I get to explore and I get to grow and I get to um, create stuff. And I get to learn. Uh, so I spend a lot of time learning. Um, if you if you don't if you don't learn something every day, then you've wasted your day. Zig Ziglar um, said, "Let me see if I get the quote correct. Um, if you, I'll summarize it. I can't remember it offhand. Record. <laughs> but if you don't, yeah, basically he's saying saying if you don't learn." Um, if you don't you don't learn to do something, then you're easily stopped. But if you continue to learn, then you can never be stopped. And so that's um, that's not an exact quote, but that's pretty much you can Google it, Zig Ziglar learning and not being stopped or whatever. Um, but that's that's the that's the thing. I try to learn something something new. I try to go and do something new every day, whether it's mainly cooking, but I try to learn something. Everybody should learn, educate yourself, grow. Uh, that's my motivational tip for the day. Very nice, mate. Lovely. Now, I, I did just write a couple of things down here. Um, you were you were mentioning before about things like uh, focusing on on yourself as the problem and accepting that the problem's not the grill, the problem's not the charcoal. That's a that's a real difficult thing for for people to do, particularly sort of anybody late Gen X or newer. Um, they've sort of been raised being told, oh, you're perfect, you're wonderful, everything you do is golden. Um, what sort of tips would you give or for, for people to be um, more constructively critical of themselves and more uh, like self-reflective and honest with themselves? Yeah, I think, I think a lot, and I did an article on, on this um, here a while back, but a lot of it has to do with, with just being uh, not too prideful in yourself. 
to know that you don't know everything. Like, you know, you hand a kid a phone, um, like, here, I need you to do stuff. And they're like, and your phone is working properly. Um, so, you know, they, they have this, this knowledge that they're always smarter than the adults, um, but they don't know everything. And, and we don't know everything. Um, I think if we, once we get to the point where we think we know everything, then, um, then we're going to stop growing. I think for the Gen Xers and, and some of the others, it just comes down to, uh, being humble enough to know that you don't know everything that you want to, you want to know everything, but you don't know everything. So let's try to, to grow from that. And I think, I think there's a humility that comes with that. Um, just, I, it's hard to explain in a way. Um, but I think pride plays a big, a big role in, in, in that. I, mean, I, I hear it with a lot of cookers um, who don't want to change. They have their way of cooking. They have their, their, their way of doing things and they just don't want to change. And a lot of that has to do with, with having a pride. They, they have their, their way of doing it. And I'm not going to vary because I know everything. But then when you throw something out at them, like I try to do a, a, um, a cook off where everybody just had to use a chimney, not one of my chimneys, just a chimney, a chimney and a grill grate. And people were freaking out over it. You know, I was going to pay them. You know, they like, I'm like, here, everybody cooks the same steak. Everybody gets to choose a chimney, just cook on it. And that's it. So everybody's even. Um, and I was still going to pay them. Re- they were still going to get a golden ticket to the world championship. They're still going to get a thousand dollars if they won. So everything was the same and people were flipping out. Like I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to spend my money and, and take a chance on cook. I'm like, dude, grow a little. Um, so I think, I think a lot of times we, we get too we get too full of ourselves as we say here um, to not um, to think we can't learn something. Uh, man, there's so much, there's so much about cooking that I don't know that I want to know. And so that's, that's how I approach everything. So uh, if you give me two bricks and a shopping cart, I want to cook on it, uh, just to see if I can and try to do a good job on it. So it's, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, that's where my mind was going. No, that was well said, man. Beautiful. Now, look, this is probably a good time for us to start wrapping up this episode. So I'm going to throw the studio open to you now. Give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout outs to people that have helped you on your barbecue journey. And do make sure you tell everybody where they can track you down on the internet. Oh, certainly. So let's start there and then work our way back. So you find me at chimneycartel.com, uh, Chimney Cartel Instagram, Chimney Cartel Facebook, um, Chimney Cartel TikTok. Um, Vic Clevenger Twitter. So that's, uh, you can find me there, those places. The, um, I'm trying to think if I've missed out anything, email me at Vic at chimneycartel.com if you want to send me, a, um, where if you need my address so you can send me some money, I can send that out to you. Um, the, uh, the people I want to thank, um, Boar's Night Out, Eric Hodson and Alan Smith, um, they kind of got me. Um, deeper into it. Yeah, you know, I learned so much from them. Mark Lambert, um, I learned a lot from them. Um, my girlfriend, Candace, who uh, she's not even in a room, so I don't even know if she's going to hear this or not. Uh, she has opened my world um, to, to culinary pursuits that I, and to her, that's just cooking for the family back home in South Africa. To me, it's just like, boom, you know, it's, it's so many different flavors. Uh, from there. So, uh, her, the, um, David, uh, Malek from Gunter Wilhelm cutlery, um, B and B charcoal, uh, those, those are the one, the shed, uh, Brad and Brooke Orson, um, those people. And I know I'm forgetting people when I start naming names. Um, the MBBQA, if, um, I know it's, I mean, you're a member of the MBBQA national barbecue and grilling association. Uh, which is, uh, we call it national, but we've got some international people that are, are members of it. So it should be the International Barbecue and Grilling Association. Um, but that, they've helped me grow um, quite a bit as well. Uh, I teach classes when we have our conferences, but I attend classes because I just want to, I just want to grow there. 
Um, and then they got some classes on, on the website. If you want to go there, once you become a member, uh, so just people like you, uh, have podcasts, uh, have helped me grow. When I, uh, when I would go to the gym and, and work out, I would have my phone on a, on, on a podcast. I've listened to smoking hot confessions and some of the others, um, just trying to, trying to grow and to learn, especially if it's somebody that I, that I've been wanting to listen to, you know, you mentioned Jess Pryles. Um, she has a unique perspective. Um, uh, um, who is the other one we mentioned a while ago? Uh, the um, barbecue ninja, Craig Vahaga. Yeah, Craig. Oh man. Uh, Craig, me and him have talked to alligators cause I've cooked several. Um, but he hunts them and I haven't hunted an alligator in probably 18 years. And now he's got me wanting to go hunt alligators again, you know? And so I, I've cooked a lot of them. He's cooked a lot of them, but it's, um, matter of fact, he cooked one at the Royal for some party that ended up going all over the internet. And I'm like, Oh God, why did I do an alligator this year? And, uh, <laughs> so, but there's just so many people that, that, that help you. And that's the thing about our barbecue world is, uh, first of all, uh, growth is where you look for it. Uh, so you look, but none of our family in the barbecue and grilling world, uh, is afraid as far as the real teachers go is afraid to tell you their secrets. They're willing to help you. They're like, Hey, won't you come and join our team? The shed is notorious for this, uh, in a good way. Uh, they'll bring people into their team in Memphis in May and show them everything they do as far as cooking a hog and cooking food and, and let them be a part of the glory that is the shed. Uh, boars not out, uh, sweet swine of mine. A lot of these guys will bring in, uh, people, then you have to work. You can't just sit around and say, Hey, uh, I'm going to watch you all. And they're going to put you to work, but you get to learn so much. So that's what I dig about our family is we're just not afraid of, of sharing our secrets with everybody. We may not show you the measurements, but we'll tell you what's going on. It. Yeah. Well said, man. Beautiful. That is a, that, that for me is the, is the key element of the barbecue scene right there. It's that willingness to share and, uh, and that, that willingness to pass on that knowledge. So look, that's probably a good point for us to, uh, to, to, uh, to wrap this up. So I'm going to say thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day on this, uh, on this incredible cooking adventure tour. Thank you very much, and I appreciate. And I want to apologize to your listeners the last time because uh, I just simply didn't set my alarm clock uh, and get up because it's uh, this where I'm at. It's six forty-five in the morning uh, when we started this. So right now it's uh, right now it's uh, seven seven fifty-nine or something like that, or nine fifty-nine. I can't remember. Uh, but we're like an hour behind. We're in Central Time Zone where I'm at. So it was uh, quite early, and I forgot to set my alarm clock. So, so I apologize to your listeners, but man, live, I appreciate you having me on here. It's all good, mate. Thank you very much. I'll look, I'll see you again soon. I look forward to it. And there you have it, family. That was the one and only Vic Clavenger, the cooking comedian, the founder of the Chimney Cartel. And if you haven't had a look at him yet, make sure you get online. Have a look at that design. It's a really interesting bit of kit. And I do love the idea of just being able to grab that, a bag of charcoal and a spatula, and you're on your way to a competition. That is a top idea. Um, we did actually forget to mention that... Um, that uh, Vic does have a great little Facebook group as well, the Chimney Cartel group as well. So if you're interested, go join that. There's some great stuff in there as well. Now, just before we close this out, just to remind you of the uh, the announcements from the top of the show, big thanks to our podcast partner, Jagged Woodfine, for being a part of this episode. If you're looking for a new smoker or grill or you've got a custom kitchen you need fitted out, hit them up. Amazing work. Lovely people. Get into them. Now, um, over on the Smoking on Confessions website, we've got our merch, our T-shirts, our hoodies, our hats, our glasses, whatnot. Uh, and while you're there, pick up your free copy of the ebook, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. And join us in the Smoking on Confessions barbecue community on Facebook, where we recorded this episode live, and also where we just hang out and talk about barbecue. And finally, on the socials, do the thing. Thumbs up, likes, shares, etc., etc. It all helps us out very much, and we really do appreciate it. And that's all there is for today. So, until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. Yeah.